Well, we are uh, fortunate enough today uh, to have secured not one speaker, but two speakers at the same time, uh, Christine and uh, Urz, uh, who are the leaders of the CAT specialist group of IUCN. And they have been so by now, I think, for many tens of years, some tens of years. Uh, sorry, <laughs> this bloody <laughs> cell phone, I forgot to switch it off. Um, yeah. Um, so, sorry. Um, yeah, I, I was saying that uh, uh, we have uh, Christine and Urs with us, and they will be talking about uh, an animal which is uh, pretty unknown, uh, I think, in uh, whose biology is pretty unknown, I think, in uh, Asia, but uh, it has been the object of some studies. Uh, the longest uh, term one, I think it is the one led by the Brett and Mozarts in, uh, in Switzerland, uh, which will be the object of the talk uh, of today. Um, I think Urz is probably, or I would say certainly, the first man uh, in Europe to start a reliable long-term research on the Eurasian links. And uh, he has collected, he and his collaborators, of course, um, have collected a lot of uh, precious information from the early beginning of the recolonization of Europe uh, by the links, which is proceeding at a rather slow pace in comparison, for example, with what the wolf has been doing. Um, and there are some reasons for that, and I expect that uh, uh, we'll be told about them. Uh, what else? Um, well, I think uh, the floor is now of uh, Christine and Urz, and uh, please uh, go ahead. Thank you, Sandro, for this uh, kind introduction. So I'm going to share the screen. <clears throat> Can you see our screen? Yes. Okay, yes. very good. So um, we will give this presentation in two parts. I'm first sorry. Here. I'm first going to talk about the historic background of the whole thing. Uh, that is a, a relatively uh, long time, large scale considerations that may be, however, relatively important for some of the countries that are in the range of the snow that put in Central Asia, because what we have experienced in Switzerland, but also in many other European countries is not untypical for, uh, for a certain phase of the development of uh, countries. And we actually are this year celebrating the 50 year um, anniversary of the first releases of links in Switzerland. And also, as Sandra has said, we have been working on this for a very long time. 50 years ago, we were indeed not um, involved in these first releases. But uh, about uh, 10 years later, I actually started to collect um, in, in, in a rather uh, random and opportunistic way, the first data on the distribution of the links in Switzerland and that actually then gave rise to these researches. Nobody at that time would have ever imagined that 50 years later, this topic is still hot and is still important. So what are we going to talk about? Um, I will first give you a very, very brief um, introduction into duration links. Then I will talk about the historic destruction of wildlife and the restoration of habitat recovery of prey and the reintroduction. Uh, so giving the, the, the background of this whole project and of what's happening in Europe now. And then Christine is looking into a uh, present problem, probably into the most pending problem of these reintroduced populations. So 
50 years after the first releases, we have uh, quite a bit of uh, genetic problems with these early reintroduced populations. I've seen that we have also um, Micha actually with us, uh, so he may in the discussion then come up and uh, also talk a little bit about possible solutions for this. And then at the end, we're going to inform you again very briefly about the conservation strategy for continental Europe how we are now, and we is not just Christine and me, but actually the whole group of uh, people working on the on the Eurasian links uh, in, in Europe actually are trying to uh, advance this. So um, <clears throat> I assume that all that will participate are, are snow leopard specialists. Now I actually see that quite a few colleagues from, from Europe are here. Never mind. that's very nice to have you all here. Uh, the, Eurasian lynx is a medium-sized cat, which is within the genus a bit of an exception. So the whole genus, which actually consists of four species, are typical uh, medium-sized cats sitting on medium-sized prey, mainly lagomorphs. The Eurasian lynx, however, in most of its range, but not everywhere actually, is a hunter of small ungulates. So insofar, we can say the Eurasian lynx is a small big cat and that actually expresses also in the in the weight of uh, males in up to 25 kilograms female they have a sexual dimorphism with regard to body mass a bit lighter um, they have a <clears throat> can have a relatively strong and fast reproduction if the ecological conditions are good so litter size in average are two can be one to four and the survival of kittens, of course, like with any other cat, depends on the ecological conditions and the uh, availability of prey. Uh, prey is in Europe and in many parts of the Asian of the Asian range too. Actually, is roe deer, and a second most important prey here in Switzerland in the Alps is the chamois, rupicabra, and rupicabra. But they have a wide range <clears throat> of species that they also actually hunt, like red foxes, hares, marmots, and so on. In northern countries, reindeer consist a relatively important part of the prey. And if we look at what I've just said above here, from different studies here in Switzerland, we can say it is a variation of a common theme. So it's roe deer, chamois, and some side dishes. I don't go into details here, but you can look at these graphs and you will see that <clears throat> in most parts, roe deer are dominant. And in some parts of the Alps where roe deer are rare and rupee capra, so the chamo actually is more uh, available, the chamo can become the major prey. Let's have a bit uh, wider look at the Eurasian lynx. It is one of the most widespread cat species in the world, stretching from the Atlantic Ocean in the west to the Pacific Ocean in the east in one huge, formerly more or less close distribution range. And then with one um, sort of specific distribution range that's in Central Asia and in the Himalayas where it overlaps, uh, as you of course can see broadly with the snow leopard. And this is a subspecies that is a bit different, uh, that looks a little bit different and probably has also quite a different ecology. Even so, we have to say that scientific data on the uh, Central Asian links is relatively scarce. With regard to Europe, you can see that the distribution range nowadays is very fragmented. That is, of course, a consequence of the uh, anthropogenic uh, alteration of the landscape, habitats, and of the wildlife. Formerly, the whole of Europe, as far as it was forested, and that was <laughs> almost everywhere in, in, in Europe, actually was a uh, uh, distribution range of the lynx. In some areas, like on the British island, it, it, it disappeared very, very early. In other areas, it disappeared mainly in the medieval ages and a bit later when most of the forest land was actually altered to agricultural land and lynx has basically uh, up to 20th century survived in the large mountain areas where we also had the uh, large forests left and <clears throat> up to recent times there were only 
like a few uh, orthostonous populations that have survived. One of which is in the Carpathian bow, that's here, as you can see. And this is important insofar as these links have then be used for most of the reintroductions in Western and Central Europe here. Let's have a look at the history and the historic downfall of not only the lynx, but actually the large um, wildlife species, basically the megafauna. So <clears throat> in, the, in the 19th century, so relatively late, the forests of the Alps and of the Jura Mountains, which have for logistic reasons relatively long be untouched in Switzerland, were heavily exploited, as you can see here. All these locks actually went abroad to countries like France, Germany, and so on, because uh, such long locks, such huge locks, actually were in extremely precious in the 19th century. That was one factor actually <clears throat> destroying the habitat of wildlife. Another factor that actually helped was uh, overgrazing by livestock. Livestock populations have increased in the 17th, 18th century until about the mid of the uh, 19th century. I'll come back to this point. And Switzerland was especially known for uh, its goat population. Switzerland had a huge uh, goat population, different breeds and so on. And goats and forests simply don't go together. You have easy forests for goats, but not both together. Uh, another factor was that uh, um, especially during and after the French Revolution, when a lot of weapons were around and when the peasants actually got the right to hunt and so on, the wildlife species, the prey species of the large carnivores were totally overexploited and were in large part, especially in my own country, eradicated. Um, at that time, the wildlife management was get as much as you can, and that was it. What I show you here is one of the uh, pictures of one of the famous uh, hunters from the Engadin, from the southeastern Swiss Alps. These people at that time were real heroes, and this guy, for instance, he traveled all the way down to Zurich just to get a picture of himself that then um, <clears throat> that he didn't actually sold. He has killed in his entire life a huge amount of uh, wildlife. He didn't even count actually how many golden eagles, uh, foxes and so on he has shot, but he has also actually shot one or two of the last remaining bears. And that was really a big thing at that time. And he was very famous. So uh, only as the last aspect, actually, I would mentioned direct persecution. Most of the historic records that we actually have refer to direct persecution because bounties were paid at that time. And if bounties were paid, it was written down. And so we have the records. But indeed, if we look, and I'm pretty sure that this is also would also be the same thing for many other large carnivores, if we look at um, how many animals were shot in the end phase, maybe between 1850 and 1900 of these animals, we can see that uh, if the populations would have been healthy, they would have been able to withstand such a um, loss through direct persecution. So even though we mostly believe that these large carnivores were actively eradicated, I think that the ecological background destruction of habitat and especially destruction of prey was much more important. Uh, but we have some historic evidence, for instance, here is a, a uh, link strap actually from the Canton of Valle that people had even fixed installations to get also the last of these critters and kill them. So the, not the destruction of the wildlife species, but the destruction of habitat has led in Switzerland to uh, increasing number of uh, environmental catastrophe, like this uh, disaster that you see here, that has killed something like 50 people. And this was a, was, was a court, sort of a, a, a waking call for Switzerland, which was at that time, in the end of the uh, 19th century, a very young federal state. And finally, the Swiss government has issued a national forest law. 
to protect the, the remaining forests in the mountains, which were also actually uh, uh, an important protective measure for the people living in these areas. And this first uh, forest law was very simple. It had basically only two principles. On the one hand, there were no forest pastures. So all livestock was banned from forests. And on the other hand, no forest clearing was allowed. So it is illegal in Switzerland to remove any forest until you would create, recreate at least the same area of forest somewhere else. And then, of course, this was supported by reforestation, as you can see in this historic picture here. So that's an area that is now completely forested. But here you can see the young forests. And then because of the um, of the ban of clearing, whatever has once been declared forest in Switzerland will remain forest forever, or at least as long as we don't change the law. Uh, another aspect that was important for the recovery of the habitat was the shift of the um, rural situation in a more urban and industrial situation. What you see here is the downfall of small ruminants, so sheep and goat, in the canton of Bern, that's the uh, canton where we are living actually, from 1790 up to more or less recent times. So this shift here was not mainly a consequence of, uh, of uh, people understanding that they had to protect the, the, the land and so on, the forest. It was purely, purely economic. So on the one hand, there was an increase in competition from wool, from abroad, Australia and so on, from cotton and so on. And uh, what especially actually has changed the pattern of uh, rural lives was the industrialization. So people have left their very small, most often very poor homesteads with sheep and goat and have moved to the cities where they found a new job in the industry. In the in industry. So what we can show in many, many areas in Switzerland are pictures like these here. I'm just showing you five, uh, four, four examples. Here, an area in the canton of Zurich, 1900, the same area uh, roughly 100 years later. Here, a area from the Jura Mountains, uh, that is Lynx area today, and again, 1880 and about 100 years later. So the recovery of the forests have then led to the recovery of the wild herbivores. Still, the society at that time actually made the distinguishing between the good animals and the bad animals and the herbivores were finally considered to be the good animals and they were allowed to, be, to come back. As early as the beginning of the 20th century, Switzerland was starting to reintroduce ibex in the Swiss Alps where they had completely be eradicated. The roe deer, again, a species hard to imagine today, totally um, eradicated from Switzerland, started a natural recolonization from the north, so from southern Germany. Um, the same actually was with the red deer, even so the uh, recolonization came from the east and was supported, these are these red dots here, by several reintroduction projects. And what you can see here now um, is the development of the hunting bag. We do not have uh, any better data, so population estimations are, or, or, or uh, like this for this long stretch from the beginning of the 20th century to now. So you can see in the beginning of the 20th century, um, there was basically nothing left. Uh, Rodier and Chamwa have started to recover a little bit earlier, so we're from the 1870s, 1880s on. And if I would add here another important species, not for the lynx, but now for the wolf, the wild boar, you will see that this population has even developed much stronger. So basically, all large carnivores and all large herbivores we had in Switzerland were eradicated, or at least did not exist, exist in, in, in viable populations in our country by the end of the 19th century. And nowadays, all of them are back and in numbers that we probably have not seen for hundreds of years, and with regard to the large carnivores in increasing numbers. This has then finally sort of led, and mainly from foresters who were actually afraid of increasing browsing damages to our um, 
Young Forests. This has finally led to discussion on the reintroduction of the large carnivores. Um, people were first thinking about the bears, hoped that they would actually recover in Italy and come back on a natural way. This hasn't happened, but Sandro could possibly actually hold a webinar on the story of the brown bear in Italy, another interesting topic. And the second in row was the lynx that has been protected by law in 1962 and has then about 10 years later been reintroduced. Um, the reintroduction in Switzerland was the first one to be successful, but it was not the only one. We have since then seen reintroductions not only in Switzerland, but also Germany, Slovenia, Italy, Austria, Czech Republic, France and Poland. And all in all, uh, we estimate that about 200 links of different origins were released in these areas in the past uh, 50 years. Here is an overview of the reintroduction projects that we are aware of. We don't want to go into details, but you can see here that by far not all of them actually were successes. Uh, many of them actually were failures, and uh, a few of them actually have led to an uh, increasing and at least vital, if not viable, population. The viability is something else. But what I actually would like to point out here, the total of animals released, you can see that all these projects, with some exceptions, actually were really small scale, pro scale projects. And some of them, um, uh, it is not surprising that they failed. For instance, in Switzerland, in the Eastern Alps, four links were released. They separated quickly. They probably ne never even met and uh, to reproduce. It needs at least one meeting between the male and the female, as we all know. Uh, others actually have been successful, even so a relatively small number of animals were released. So all what you see here is to a large part stochastic. And the records of these early, the data of these early releases are so scarce that we can very often not really judge what the reason for success or for failure was. But we have, of course, the result nowadays. And this is this pattern that you can see here. Uh -huh. So we have over here the Carpathian bow with the uh -huh. um, autochthonous population of the Carpathian lynx, which is considered to be a different subspecies of lynx. I will come back to this. And then we have here all the reintroduced populations. So the first one to be created was the one in the Swiss Alps here, Northwestern Alps is still the stronghold of the Alpine lynx population. Then the Jura Mountains, and very early on, we had also a reintroduction in then former uh, Yugoslavia, actually in Southern Slovenia, that was also very successful, that also now actually undergoes a major uh, sort of uh, reinforcements because of uh, genetic problems, as you will hear later. Then we had other reintroduction projects here. All these reintroduction projects are up to now relatively small populations, and they are still disconnected. So what we lack is uh, big viable populations and connectivity between these populations. And now I hand over to Christine, and she is actually going to talk about the most pending problems at the moment. So what you see here are the, the reintroduced populations and their status uh, in 2012 and 2016. The IUCN uh, Large Carnivore Initiative for Europe Specialist Group is regularly assessing the status of uh, the uh, carnivores. And what we see is we have an increase still also today, an increase in the um, population in the Swiss Alps, in the Tura Mountains, and in the Harz. The others are stable, but even in these increasing populations, the red list status is either endangered or critically endangered. So if we make a a demographic assessment and use a traffic light system. We see that in Switzerland, the populations are doing okay. Others um, are doing medium or unsatisfactory and some of them are doing poor. 
uh, reintroduced populations, it's really for reintroduced populations, it's really important to follow not only the demographic parameters, but also the genetics and in the long term. We started a project in quite a while ago, 20 years ago, and collected samples from all autochthonous populations across Europe. Um, the source population, of course, for uh, all the reintroduced populations in Western and Central Europe and the reintroduced populations. And what we see is that um, the Carpathian Mountains, they are also, they underwent some um, bottleneck in the past. They are still okay in regard to genetic diversity. You see here the expected and the observed uh, diversity and the alleles per locus for 20 microsats that were uh, analyzed. But we see that in the Swiss Alps are doing poor. So do the Jura Mountains are doing better and the other reintroduced populations but are also doing poor. So if we use the same traffic light system, we see that a totally different picture. And we see, remember the three populations in Switzerland were all green when it comes to demographics. But now we have a red for the Alps and two yellows for the other two populations. The same for the dynamic range for BBA, for the, the Bavarian, Bohemian, Austrian population and the Walsh Mountains. Why do we have this difference in Switzerland? You have seen the list that was showed. They were funded, uh, founded with the same number of individuals, eight to 10. Um, and Urs mentioned the word stochasticity. We have to understand the evolution of the populations to be able to explain this pattern. What you see here is um, three data sets for that actually quite nicely show the evolution of the population. We have the known losses, we have chance observations, and we have killed livestock. So known losses and killed livestock have been collected since the very beginning. The population was founded in 1971, that's um, the Swiss, in the Swiss Alps. So we had a very long period of a low population level. And for a reintroduced population, this is really the worst because you lose genetic diversity. Then we had an increase and the high links density in the late 1990s. And because of a lot of uh, livestock killed, there were immediate management interventions. So there was legal killing of livestock graders, there was um, animals removed for translocation, and there was a heavy poaching wave. So after the first bottleneck, that was uh, the, the, the releases, the introduction, there was a second bottleneck created by management interventions. And the population then, again, was idling on a relatively low level and only um, 15 years later started to increase again. So what happened to the genetic variability? What you see here is a moving window of 40 animals over the median of the birth year of the uh, lynx analyzed. And you see early on, you had this increase, initial increase in the 1990s, and then the management interventions happened. And since then, it's just decreasing. So in the first <coughs> bottleneck, you usually uh, lose the rare alleles. That's the founder effect. But then if you create a second bottleneck, then you just lose heterozygosity and the population cannot recover from this bottleneck here. So we have this very um, special situation that we have decreasing genetic variability, but an increasing population. Of course, for us, it was of utmost um, interest to see whether there is any uh, gene flow between the two populations, especially in the Alps and the Tura Mountains, because these two populations are separated by the um, plateau, which is heavily populated by humans. Until 1995 or 1994, actually, we had the situation, here are the Carpathian Mountains, every dot is one individual, and all the individuals from the same population have the same color. So 
1994, these two populations were clearly strongly separated. So there was no gene flow. And what you can see in this picture is the strong genetic drift these two populations experienced. They, they drifted away, but they drifted away in two different um, directions. So they are today quite distinct. In 1995, we um, caught the first male in the Jura Mountains that originated from the Alps. And in 2009, a female um, was put to an enclosure and she escaped. And so we have these two individuals that we are where we know the origin. And what happened to the genetics is uh, through the mating uh, of two animals from the Alps with Jura lynx, the genetic basis uh, improved and, and got larger, but only in this direction, not in this direction. So not, I mean, it's still a, a reduced genetic variability, but it's much better than in, um, than in the Alps. So we have these two individuals and you can see every time the reaction of the genetic uh, um, variability. We have this rule of thumb that says, you know, we should have at least one immigrant per generation. Generation of links is five years. And, you know, we only have it twice and it's not every generation. So if there is no further immigration, the genetic variability also in the Tura Mountains will decrease. In the Alps, you see that um, since these management interventions at the end of the 1990s, the genetic variability just keeps decreasing. So, of course, you can imagine isolated populations, they face inbreeding problems. And the question is whether when inbreeding becomes a problem and inbreeding depression, inbreeding per se does not need to be a problem, but then it becomes an inbreeding depression, it is a problem. So there are, we developed in a workshop in 2011, two, two rules of thumb. Um, one, if FIT is approaching 0.25, so that means that everybody is a sibling of each other, that's time for an alarm. Of course, you always need to compare your genetic um, variables with outbred populations, because it's all, all these values are uh, species specific and relative. And the second one is that NE, when NE is below 50, the effective population size is below 50, either in a single population or a meta population, this is a problem. Nowadays, you know, this is this a famous 5500 rule, effective 50 num numbers 500 has been questioned um, repeatedly lately, and this has been increased to 100. Of course, if inbreeding happens very fast, then you get more problems. So if your NE is very small, then the problems are more severe. And it is highly environmental, environment dependent. So in a stable environment, uh, smaller NE populations may persist longer. But if then a challenge comes, then they are also doomed. So habitat fragmentation may limit um, your goal of, of NE 50 or 100. So then you need um, to go for a managed meta population. We quickly scored uh, the populations across Europe, and you see that none of the reintroduced population has reached NE50. Um, and of course, F is more difficult to, to estimate, but um, definitely in the Dynaric range and in the Alps, we have also approached this value. Now, several health problems could be a consequence of genetic impoverishment. We have the very famous example of the Florida panther. Here you have some um, traits, some correlates that can show up. For instance, increase in susceptibility to infectious disease, malformations, uh, reproductive problems, or histological lesions. The Florida panther had it almost everything. The Iberian lynx has some of it. Wolves in Sweden have definitely an inbreeding problem in regard to uh, reproductive uh, traits. 
uh, for duration links in Switzerland, we didn't find uh, anything in regard to diseases or malformations or reproductive problems so far. But what we see in the population, mainly in the population in the Alps, we do survey demog demography, of course, very closely, but also the health status since many years. Um, so what we observe is uh, cardiomyopathy, that's the replacement of um, heart muscle. And we also see uh, changes in the coronary arteria, so arteriosclerosis. And second, at live captures, we uh, register heart murmurs. So we run the project um, together with the veterinary faculty, the Phoebe in Bern, where we try to see the relationship between the two. And luckily, we have also colleagues in other populations uh, who help, who register their heart. So we see if this is a specific Swiss problem or whether it's also in other links populations. What is known, um, it was initially more males than females, but now we have it almost equally in the two sexes. In domestic animals, it is inherited, that's known, and there are more males than females are um, affected. So, um, and it's there, it's an autosomal recessive inheritance. So what we try to find out is also in the links, if this, if there is an, if this is inherited, this cardiomyopathy or not. And um, so we might have to fill in this here. So to be able to say whether it's inherited or not, we try to reconstruct um, pedigrees. Um, so, and try to map these heart lesions that are uh, registered with dead animals and the heart murmurs um, in these uh, families and see if there is a, if we find out an inheritance. Of course, this is quite a tedious job because um, to reconstruct pedigrees, you need a combination of different data sets. Genetics alone does not do it. So we need um, these radio telemetry studies where we have access to live animals. And we need to be able to follow these families also through camera trapping um, that we apply uh, every year. So here we have a time span of animals from born in 92 to animals born uh, in 2016. So you can see um, how long it takes to reconstruct such, such a family tree. So in, um, in, with this background of the genetic impoverishment of these reintroduced populations and several projects popping up for further releases, we thought it would be really important to have a common approach across continental Europe and to, to be on the same page. So we um, had a conference in Bonn in 2019. Also some colleagues who were there are among the audience, which is really nice to see, um, where we uh, just published the proceedings. They can be downloaded from the Cat Specialist Group website. And um, we made an analysis of all the different populations, but then we had also a lot of topical uh, uh, contributions. So we have three subspecies. We have the nominate form in the north, we have the Carpathian links in the center, and we have the Balkan links in the south. And as most of the, the majority of the reintroductions uh, were done with um, the Carpathian links here in Western and Central Europe, the Harz Mountain is an exception, um, we have to uh, really also take care of this entire range here. So, the outcome, besides all these papers I already mentioned, um, is a set of recommendations that uh, all of us try to follow. It's strengthen the threatened autochthonous populations, monitoring and improving genetic diversity of the reintroduced populations, common monitoring and management of cross-border populations, improve connectivity among populations, that might need a meta population management approach, establish a common genetic monitoring of all links populations. So we can also compare, develop a genetic meta population management plan. So to see 
how we can reinforce these populations also uh, with exchange of individuals between the populations, use the appropriate stock for reintroductions. This hasn't been followed uh, in the past, unfortunately, so we have some uh, mixed populations with um, links from Asia, which is not what we want to see in, in Europe. Develop protocols for breeding, husbandry training, and evaluation of animals for release, because there is a number of planned reintroductions, and we see that it is really hard to um, get enough life captures. We can also not deplete the population in, Slo in uh, Slovakia, for instance. And develop protocols for capture, health examination, and transport of links. So you see a whole set of um, recommendations that are under, some of them are, um, protocols are under uh, development. Some of them already exist. For instance, number nine is pretty much um, one of the chapters of the proceedings. And um, so we hope with these recommendations, we'll be able to improve the situation in Western Central Europe for links. Okay, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Christian and Urz, for uh, your talk, which I think it has uh, touched uh, very many topics. And uh, now let's see whether there are already questions. If there are none, I have a couple of questions, but uh, no, there are some. So Justin is asking, what are the current other major threats <clears throat> to lynx population in the Jura and the Alps? Roadkill, poaching. Yeah, <clears throat> poaching is a constant threat, and uh, and uh, roadkills, of course, also. So generally, the anthropogenic um, reasons take relatively large pull and actually are responsible for a much higher turnover of the lynx population um, than a natural or untouched population would have. Uh, but I think that is nowadays true for all populations in Europe. Um, poaching is always a bit of a, 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 a come and go uh, with regard to the uh, conflict situation with local people and in links different to wolf for instance uh, the major conflict is with hunters with links and not with uh, and not with livestock breeders so um, in Switzerland and I think that's the case for most European countries whether they have autochthonous or reintroduced populations the depredation of links on livestock can be managed in a way that is not causing uh, unbearable conflicts However, links can have, and under certain circumstances really also have, a relatively important impact on their main prey populations, so roe deer and chamois. We did not go into this uh, at all. This would be a topic for an additional <laughs> talk. It, it's a huge thing and so on. And this can cause conflicts that then lead to increased poaching and because the conflict is mainly with hunters, they have a relatively easy way to actually sort of uh, um, make links clandestinely disappear so that you don't know about. So the data on poaching is relatively rare, but everybody who is a links expert and everybody who has looked into it considers that uh, poaching as a hidden cause of mortality is a relatively important aspect. But on the normal circumstances, a lynx population can stand these uh, anthropogenic losses. So it is possible to maintain uh, vital lynx populations, even in densely populated countries in Western Europe. But especially conflicts have to be managed. Thank you. If there are no other questions, I don't see it any new one at the moment, uh, then I like to ask, um, what do you think about uh, the recolonization of the wolf in connection with uh, potential competition with the wolf? 
uh, everybody knows that in the last few decades, the wolf has had the real population eruption in Europe. Uh, would you expect that this sharp increase could, could work as a limiting factor to link dispersal and the recolonization through competition, uh, through aggressive interference? I wouldn't expect this. Um, I think the most important uh, effect of this uh, vast spread of wolves um, on the lynx population is again the political and the conflict situation. So uh, in several countries, um, actually we can see we can see sort of uh, two different uh, and opposing effects. So in some countries, and even within Switzerland, in some areas, the conflict over wolf has uh, increased the general conflict over, over large carnivores. And, and the local population is defending itself strongly against the return of these uh, bad animals as they are still are considered. In other areas, um, the discussion over the wolf has sort of uh, reduce the discussion over the links and the links goes more in the in in the, in, in the political shadow of the of, of the wolf but generally i think that the um, return of the wolf has uh, sort of had a major impact on the discussion over the wolf also very different in very different in, in different countries in europe um what i would like to mention uh, sandro because you mentioned it it's uh, it's quite interesting to see how slow the lynx populations have spread and 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 how these lynx populations even after 50 years actually haven't reached a huge range and a viable population status compared to wolves which have now basically <laughs> wolves are basically overrunning europe as you know it's it's absolutely amazing we have nowadays wolves in denmark in the netherlands in in, in parts where we 30 years ago would never ever have imagined that wolves could could even live and the difference is mainly a um a biological ecological and life uh, history history aspects cats in general and I'm pretty sure this would also be the case uh, for snow leopards are relatively conservative because females are mainly philopatric and even so uh, individual cats can uh, disperse over big distances and, uh, and, and the lynx actually, uh, there is no barrier that actually can stop the lynx with the exception of broad uh, bodies of water <laughs> like the Lake of Geneva or, or, or the Adriatic Sea or whatever. And, uh, and and therefore, but the population itself, which needs the spread of reproducing females, actually goes very, very slowly. And the lynx population, as a population, not as individuals, has really a problem to overcome uh, habitat barriers. So like uh, large um, areas of open land and so on. That's why lynx uh, recolonization needs to be assisted. I'm pretty sure that even in, in Central Europe, even in, in countries like Germany with this spread sort of midi, um, secondary mountain change, which are good forested, that if we once have established lynx population, the genetic uh, exchange would be sufficient. But to reach them, it needs a assisted dispersal. So say reintroductions. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so can we say that the wolf could be an additional, uh, maybe not, ma not major, but uh, minor limiting factor? You know, I've seen the data uh, from the thesis uh, by Shannon uh, Keschel on uh, snow leopard and wolves in um, Kyrgyzstan. And uh, yeah. it's amazing the separation of habitat they have. And uh, uh, there are a few rare records uh, of people who filmed the interactions between the wolves and the snow leopards. And the wolves were definitely winning the interaction because they behave like one animal, but actually they are a group. So uh, it's not easy for, uh, for a cat uh, to, to deal with a, a pack of uh, four or five wolves. Uh, and, and they are attacking the cats. 
so um, maybe they could uh, contribute to prevent uh, the spread of dispersing individuals. We do not have yet that much overlap between the two species. Um, only lately the Chura got okay. colonized by wolves. And um, there, of course, we will see that's only, you know, they had only one, there's only one pack overlapping in the, in the uh, lynx area. And then in eastern, uh, southeastern Switzerland, in the Grisons, we have both species arriving together in the same area. So this is going to be very interesting to see how, how this evolves. Yes. But of course, generally, you know, in, in, in eastern uh, Europe, for instance, in the, in the Carpathian Mountains, we had all this and, and, and still have up to now actually a sympathetic occurrence of the two species. Uh, my guess is that the habitat separation of, of uh, snow leopard and wolf would be stronger than of lynx and, uh, and, 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 and wolf. And, and yet we have no indication that in North of Thorne's population there was a major problem. Also because wherever they occur sympathetically, they seem to separate with regard to the prey uh, to the mate to, to the major prey species so roe deer is definitely a killer of the smaller wild ungulates whereas uh, uh, wolves have a broader diet spectrum and wherever they are abundant enough they uh, prefer red deer okay thank you i see that there are several more questions uh, one is from gustav samelius and this says a small detail, but I got surprised to see the average weight of lynx males, 24 kilograms. I think the average weight in Scandinavia is about 20 to, to 21 kilograms. We have a few males that have reached the 26, 28 kilograms, but that's a really huge male. Female weights are roughly the same. Strange right. that the male lynx in the Alps are so much, 10, 15% on average, larger. Yeah. Yeah, I think there is a discrepancy between people and links in Scandinavia and Central Europe. While the Scandinavian people are larger in our oh, areas, the links are larger. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Gustav. Um, yes, it is, it is, it is true. Uh, the Carpathian lynx is among all the subspecies. Um, Eurasian lynx has some quite distinct subspecies. That's a question of the, of the Pleistocene history of the species. Um, it's also one of the differences to wolves. But anyway, so the Carpathian subspecies is one of the, of the bigger ones. So actually the second biggest uh, in, in the whole and has a relatively prominent uh, sexual dimorphism with regard to, um, with regard to body, body, ma body mass. So as a matter of fact, uh, Sandra, we have uh, records of male Carpathian links up to 36 kilograms. However, these are records from old hunting books and nobody actually sort of uh, really, really believes that this is true. But all uh, projects that were actually uh, dealing with Carpathian lynx have had records of uh, male lynx of up to 25, okay. up to 28 and 29 kilogram. Depends a little bit on how much they have been eating, but yes. And the sexual dimorphism is relatively strong, and we can also see, at least here in the Alps, that the sexual the, the sexual dimorphism leads to um, to separated food niches. So while male lynx hunt more chamois, and a a, a, a grown up chamois can be up to forty five kilogram, um, uh, female lynx tend really to stick on younger animals or mainly on roe deer. So. Um, yeah, but, but Gustav is right, the Scandinavian lynx are in average a bit smaller. Uh, even so, I actually quite um, surprised how much smaller they are compared to the fact that they live uh, in the northern areas, mainly on road deer, uh, on reindeer, sorry. Um, but, but we know that, that uh, all cats can kill prey that are much larger than their own body size. And uh, there is uh, a follow-up by Gustav uh, saying uh, another question, but uh, it might be too long uh, to answer. Eurasian lynx and snow leopards are most similar of the cats in some ways. Similar area and the strict breeding season. Lynx breed every year and feel female often give birth uh, as uh, one uh, and a half year old. 
meter size are similar and perhaps also longevity. Yet the snow leopard females start reproducing at three or four years of age, give birth every second year at most. This means that they have different reproductive strategies, lynx fast, snow leopards very, very slow. Uh, pre pre I don't understand. Data suggests that the snow leopard, preliminary data suggests that the snow leopard cub survival is very high, whereas the lynx kitten survival is quite low, in Scandinavia at least. How would you say that this could affect recolonization and conservation in general? That's a, it's, a, it's an interesting question, Gustav, and I think that would uh, require a longer along the discussion, let me just um, uh, give some spontaneous thoughts. So um, the genus lynx is per se actually a hunter of lagomorphs. So uh, Iberian lynx, the bobcat, so lynx rufus, and the Canada lynx, uh, which are, as we all know, sitting mainly on, on, on snowshoe hairs, um, they have a different idea. The exception here is the Eurasian lynx in most parts of its of its area. There is some areas in uh, say Siberia, in central Siberia, where um, Eurasian lynx are only mainly actually uh, hunting uh, snow uh, hares, so mountain hares or snow hares, whatever you actually you call them, Arctic hares, and uh, and. So part of the life history that we see in Eurasian lynx today, actually, may be part of its evolutionary history and of the evolutionary history of the whole genus. So the um, sort of fact that the Eurasian lynx today is a hunter of small ungulates is probably a relatively recent evolution, evolutionary trait. So I would guess this has started only in the late Pleistocene or in the, in the Holocene, and so may not be older than 30, 40,000 years ago. Um, we do not exactly know what uh, sort of uh, the main prey of the Pleistocene lynx was, Isidorensis was the immediate, and it would be most interesting to have really good studies on the Central Asian uh, lynx on um, Isabellinos, because we can assume that the ecology of this subspecies of lynx is quite a bit different. And this may also among us is actually be influenced by the fact that there they overlap with a larger cat so that the competition between the cat species there are a bit different. So this may have influenced also uh, the life history and that on, I can at the moment not see any impact on that the lynx compared to the snow leopard is a, a little bit more R strategic. Uh, or with regard to the recolonization, but if there would be any, I would assume that the snow leopard is even more conservative with regard to the recolonization and spreading of a population. But then, of course, this depends also on the uh, preferred habitat, on the fragmentation of the habitat, and so on and so on. But indeed, uh, I mean, we haven't been uh, talking about this, but indeed, it would be most interesting to have a good ecological and life history study of the two species in an area where they really overlap and exist sympatrically. We could learn a lot also with regard to the basic uh, biology of cats. Justin is also asking um, about roe deer and chamois. Um, are they currently monitored across Switzerland? Uh, and if so, it is still based largely on the hunting bags or, um, well, uh, asking us mm -hmm. monitoring prey is no leopard landscape remains a, a, a challenge. <laughs> I would say okay. that to say yeah. it's a local challenge. <laughs> um, Justin, to explain you, the wildlife monitoring system of Switzerland would take another three days because uh, <laughs> Switzerland is a politically extremely fragmented country. We have three different hunting systems. We have 26 cantons and they are responsible for the wildlife monitoring. Um, in general, we can say that uh, the monitoring of forest living herbivores is not very good, but we have some records. With chamois, it's a bit easier because they are living in more open habitat than uh, um, the traditional way of counting them, which is counting them. <laughs> actually, visual counting them actually may be a bit more accurate. So um, we have good 
information about mortalities because not only the hunting back, but also all other actually sort of discovered mortalities are recorded and reported. This gives a certain index. Uh, we can, we have certain attempts to monitor uh, these uh, mountain ungulates so that we at least have probably a good indication on the trend, but the absolute numbers are still the challenge. But we would, we would definitely know the trend and we can also actually sort of then, uh, of course it's, it's correlative, so it's, it's correlation, but we can def definitely also deduce uh, the general impact of lynx predation because we have relatively good records on lynx predation on the major prey population and compare them with other causes of mortality. Uh, I have a very quick uh, question, Kurtz. Uh, How do lynxes lay cats? Uh, do they bury them? Uh, do they build latrines? Uh, it seems a rather naive question, but I, I you know, I, I recently, uh, two years ago in Tibet, we found um, a kind of latrine. There were some 15, 20, scats since they were close to a wolf then i assumed that they belonged to wolves but after the dna showed that they were from a male lynx where so, was this pardon where was this in tibet in shinghai ah, in tibet Okay, that's Isabelinos. I, I really don't think that we have enough information about the basic ecology and, and biology of Isabelinos to answer the question. I can answer it from, uh, from my point of view, and I think we have Micha with us who can actually back me up uh, with another population of the capacitive links. Um, we have never found latrines. I know and we have seen latrines in Iberian links and in Canada links, they do it, but in Eurasian links here in Europe, we have never seen latrines. But yes, most often they cover their scats. That's also why it is so difficult to uh, work with uh, excrements in, uh, in, in, in Eurasian links if you do not have a specific means, either tracks in the winter, in snow, or, okay. or, or sniffing dogs and so on, to find the scats and to make a comprehensive uh, study. They uh, set it down and they cover it and so on, and then it's gone. But I've never seen latrines. I, sometimes I found scats where I had the assumption, but it was never more than an assumption that they actually kind of used them to mark and to put them on exposed places. But I can, I, I, I would not be able to say whether this was just by coincidence or whether it was really an intention of the animal behind it. But uh, uh, in our areas, uh, links uh, communicate by. Uh, olfactorically by, by urine marks. That's very clear. That is the, that is the way of how they actually use olfactoric uh, communication, not by scats. Uh, do they lay urine on trees or uh, which yeah. kind of... What, whatever, whatever, is, whatever is obvious. If you, if you walk a kind of a lynx pass or a wildlife park or whatever actually and so, and you see something that is outstanding, whether it's a tree or a stone, or even a log pile and so on. That's also what links see, and that's where they actually, uh, where they actually mark. Yeah, my last remark was that in Tibet, uh, as you know, there are no trees, so uh, right. uh, maybe they uh, could uh, be pushed to build the latrines in absence of an appropriate background on which uh, to spray urine. Uh, of course, they could do it on, uh, on the floor, on the ground, but. Uh, I mean, it was just a wild idea. <laughs> okay, so well, maybe uh, I, I mean we know we know that we know that that leopards do such things, so scratching and 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 putting putting scats there and so on in open habitats of uh, of Asia and so on. So uh, it may really be habitat dependent. It may be dependent on the on the general land tenure system, which again for these Avellinos, we just don't know it. And uh, it may depend on, on, on different factors. It may even depend on the, on the, on the climate. You know, in, 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 in cold, dry climate, the uh, scats uh, keep much longer than in our moist, uh, relatively warm climate, you defecate and two days later it's gone. Yeah, there is an interesting comment by Miha. 
uh, the cells that uh, also in dinaric mountains links usually cover their scats, but occasionally uh, they find sites where they rep have repeatedly found links scats sometimes up to two three together. Right. Um, two three individuals uh, in the same uh, latrine or uh, two three scats together. Well, to be to be honest, I wouldn't even know uh, what a lat uh, how a latrine is. Two three used. scats. Oh, okay, Miha is telling uh, that it's two three scats at the same yeah. site. Yeah. But the, the the site I found. I mean, we found uh, there are some Chinese uh, scientists with me. Uh, it had uh, no less than uh, 15, 20 scats. <laughs> yeah, no. I mean, I mean, even even what even what the. Uh, uh, even what uh, what Micha says actually is, uh, is is quite interesting for me. I do not remember a single case where I would have found more than one scat together, with exception of just in the immediate vicinity of a of a of a kill, where links probably just have to defecate more often because they're eating eating a lot. Sometimes these links can eat uh, 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 enormous amount of meat at one night, and then they probably have a need for more defecating. And then you can have cats at least at least close together. But away from kills, I do not remember a single case where I had uh, more than one lynx cat. Interesting. Um, are there any more questions? There is an interesting comment by Orian, uh, which tells uh, that uh, uh, today we have had a lot of interesting comparisons uh, um, and ideas, and we should discuss them over a beer one day. So if it is uh, over a glass of wine, uh, I'm sure nobody else will, uh, will uh, object. So maybe who knows if we get links enough in Italy, maybe we could discuss it in Italy. And you know, in, in Central Asia, I would not even mind to discuss links over a, over a cup of tea. So <laughs> <laughs> even so, uh, anything. But but I I would I would just like to to mention that that the the area where many of those who are now actually listening to to our webinar actually are working with snow leopards. This is an area where we have very little knowledge about about uh, links and. And yet it is very interesting. And I think that it would be worthwhile if all of you actually sort of keep all of the links in mind while you're doing your field work. And uh, I know, so one thing that would certainly be interesting is just to look at all the bycatches uh, of links from, uh, from snow leopard uh, camera trapping. We could probably even do a little bit of a, a habitat comparison of the two species. And I assume that we will find in these areas some uh, interesting findings uh, on links that we cannot know here from from Europe. I mean most of the of the scientific work uh, scientific work on Eurasian links was so far done in Europe and, and 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 I think it would be very interesting to work more on this uh, species in in Central Asia. Also because uh, as uh, I've mentioned uh, with regard to uh, Gustav's question, the Eurasian lynx is a very interesting species because it was so strongly shaped by the late Pleistocene distribution. And we will probably find some uh, quite uh, amazing uh, differences between the, the different areas and subspecies also with regard to its ecology or life history and so on. <clears throat> Right, so if there are no more questions, I think we have to be very grateful and uh, say thank you to Kristen and uh, Urs. We have learned, at least I have learned uh, quite a bit about the links from their talk. Um, I didn't know many of the information they provided. And uh, I think the discussion has also been particularly stimulating. I agree on uh, Orient's comment. Uh, <laughs> and it shows that uh, uh, we don't know so much about the links. I mean, we have started learning something about the links in Europe, but uh, the Asia is a big question mark. And uh, uh, people who, who are lucky enough 
to, to be and work in Asia, I think uh, I would like to reinforce uh, Urs' suggestion that they keep an eye on lengths. Even just publishing a short paper on food habits may be important. Uh, when you have very few informations, if any, even small information uh, can be quite important. So I'd like to stimulate people living in Asia uh, to collect data on this elusive and very beautiful species. Not so beautiful like the snow leopard, of course. But <laughs> <laughs> the tail is much shorter, you know. <laughs> yeah, Sandro, everybody knows that links are the real pinnacle of evolution. <laughs> 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 okay. <laughs> okay. So, bye everybody and thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. And hope to continue this once, whether in a webinar or over a beer or over a cup of tea. Thank you oh, very much bye. for your <laughs> <laughs> <or> Ciao. <laughs> Ciao, everybody. Thank Ciao. you, everyone. Thank you.